from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is the Coral Ridge Hour. What will you find out when you follow the money? Almost everything you see is connected. It is one big web of lies. Where's the money trail? And it tracks back to billions of dollars coming from George Soros into culture. Get the facts in this meticulously compiled Follow the Money Influence Chart and Companion Guide, which shows in graphic detail how George Soros and company undermine your freedom and seek to radically transform America. We know that there are billionaires, George Soros being one of them, funding these groups that are creating chaos. Contact us today to receive your copy of the Follow the Money Chart and Guide. We have done the homework to separate the facts from the myths regarding George Soros and company. And we'll send you these vital resources as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. And now may we hear the word of God as it's found first in 2 Chronicles 7. We'll begin our reading with verse 11, 2 Chronicles 7, 11. May we hear the inspired word of our God. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And King David said, But thou, Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifting up of mine head. And may God speak to us today through his holy word and may his name ever be praised. America had been attacked. The attack was directed at New York and elsewhere. And it was not by just a few people, it was by the mightiest nation on earth. We were at war. And the commander in chief of our armed forces issued a general order, which of course dealt with what he felt was the most important thing to be considered that we were being, now that we were being attacked by the mightiest force on planet Earth. That commander in chief, of course, as you have already figured out, was George Washington, a different George. And this is what he said. The British are a deceitful people. We need to be very careful. We need to attack them swiftly, carefully, and in the war peremptor peremptorily. No, that's not what he said at all. What he said in light of that context would be to the average American astonishing. We had just been attacked by the mightiest empire on earth. And this is what he said to his soldiers. General order, the general is sorry to be informed that the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing, a vice hitherto almost unknown in the American army, is growing into fashion. He hopes that the officers will, by example as well as influence, endeavor to check it, and that both they as well as the men will reflect that we can have little hope of the blessings of heaven on our arms if we insult heaven by our impiety and folly. Added to this, it is a vice so mean and low, without any temptation, that every man of sense and character detests and despises it. Revelation assures us that righteousness exalteth a nation. You see, George Washington believed that there were more than two actors in that great drama which was about to unfold in young America. There were the British forces, which was the largest navy ever to exist on this planet. And there was the American army, underpaid, underclothed, underfed, with few, relatively few arms. But there was a third, and that actor in the great drama was God. 
the only hope he believed of American victory was our complete dependence upon God and our righteousness in his sight. How can we expect the blessings of God, the blessings of heaven upon our arms if we insult heaven, if we insult God by our impiety and folly, by our profane cursing and profanity? Washington was a great man because he was a great spiritual man. He understood what really was going on. And there is no doubt in the minds of any historian that the salutary providences of God during that war were so numerous and so clear that Washington could say himself at the end of the contest that he would be worse than an infidel. And in Washington's mind, there was hardly anything worse than an infidel who should not acknowledge the providence of Almighty God in bringing us through that extraordinarily unequal contest. So said the greatest of our presidents, the father of our country, Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of these United States, was also a president during wartime. He immediately declared a day of fasting and repentance and prayer, and then two years later did so again. And in that, Lincoln said, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. He went on to say, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. Dear friends, in 1861, America seemed like a gigantic prayer meeting compared to today. But we have, he said, forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand that preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Today's secularists cannot even imagine a drama with any more 
without an antagonist and a protagonist. There are only two actors on the stage, for they are spiritually blind, and they do not know that the outcome is in the hands of the Lord, and that the divine sovereignty and providence of God is the overarching purpose in all things, and especially in something like this. They knew that there was such a thing as a divine shield, and that without it, there was little hope for us beside death and desolation. They knew the word of God, which says, quote, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Who is like unto thee, O people, save by the Lord, the shield of thy help? For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him about as with a shield? He is our help and our shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Ah, dear friends, this is what we can do. We can pray that God will indeed be pleased to give victory to our arms and deliver us from this bloodshed and grant us peace. But, said Lincoln, we have been too proud to pray. The warnings in scripture against pride are numerous. For example, the Lord detests all of the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they shall not go unpunished. I wonder if you believe that, that if you are proud of heart, that you will somehow, some way, go unpunished. I do not, because I do not believe that God can lie. The Lord tears down the proud man's house, but he keeps the widow's boundaries intact. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him will I not endure, saith the Lord. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourself. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. God the lofty one says, I live in a high and holy place and also with him is he who is contrite and lowly in spirit. And he has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And if my people, called by my name, will humble themselves. This is where it all begins. Because in the scripture, the greatest of sins is pride. It was pride that turned Lucifer, the angel of light, into Satan, the demon of darkness. And pride goeth before destruction and a fall. 
And the Bible is very clear that many other sins which most people take to be far more serious are peccadillos compared to the spiritual sin of pride. It is pride that makes devils. And dear friends, we need to humble ourselves to acknowledge our sins, to acknowledge our unworthiness. We need to pray for not only ourselves, but our church and the church throughout the nation, and pray that God will grant us humility of spirit, that we may be able to pray in a way that will be acceptable and pleasing to God. Until we have first confessed our sins and our unworthiness, our prayers will but bounce off of heaven. And then God will hear from heaven, answer our prayers, forgive our sins, if we will do that. Dear friend, I hope that you are praying for not only yourself, but for your nation as well. That God may in all of this accomplish his purpose, and his purpose is to quicken his people, that there may be a revival amidst the church of Christ throughout this nation and world. God has done many things. Through revivals, things that happened very quickly. Again, thinking of New York. I think of years ago when one man put up a poster that there would be a prayer meeting in that place. It was just a rented room on a certain day at noon. The following week, he came to the place at the appointed time, which he had appointed, and there was nobody there. So he started praying. A half an hour later, somebody else came. Before the hour was up, there were six people there. The following week, there were 50 people there. And the following week, 100. And then prayer meetings were started all over New York. And suddenly, very quickly, a quarter of a million people were swept into the kingdom of God. And in the time of this event, that was an enormous proportion of the people of that great city. God can act to build up as quickly as he can tear down. And so may God make us men and women of prayer and of believing prayer that God will use all of this to turn the hearts of men and women unto himself, to bring repentance to his own people, and to build the kingdom of God through the lives of many others that will see our prayer life, to see our faith, and who will be drawn unto him. Indeed, many people have asked questions that were asked in the Old Testament about Israel when they were sorely punished by God. They will say, says the scripture, why hath the Lord done this unto Israel, to this land? The answer given was, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand, saith the Lord. He is the sovereign Lord God Almighty. He raises up one and casts down another. It is God that reigneth in the affairs of men. We cannot, as Washington was not, as Lincoln was not, be blind to the fact that the Almighty has his own purposes. Let us be men and women of faith as well as courage. Ah, my friends, I do not believe, unless God's people in this nation repent of their sins, turn from their wicked ways, and seek the face of God, that we will find anything but a long and difficult and expensive in the worst 
sense of that word. Struggle before us. We need to begin where Washington began. We need to begin, begin where Lincoln began. We need to begin with ourselves, with the people of God. Are you a man or woman of prayer? Have you truly humbled yourself before God? Are you seeking his face? It's often been said that we frequently seek his hand and seldom his face. To seek the face of God is like to seek the face of another person rather than their hand. Surely, this is something that every wealthy person has struggled with and has been grieved by others supposed friends have sought them, but it seems so often it is their hand, their checkbook that they have sought and not their face, not their friendship, not themselves, but merely the hand. How is it with your prayers? Do you seek a personal relationship with God? What place does adoration play in your prayers? There may be forgiveness. There may be thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is thanking God for what he has done for us. Adoration is praising God for who he is. Thanksgiving is thanking God for his hand. Adoration is praising God for his face, for who he is for this marvelous, holy, wise, gracious, and good God. How much of a place does adoration play in your prayers? That's how you will know whether you are seeking the hand or face of God. And turn from your wicked ways, he says, well, we live in a world where the ungodly are so plunged into the mire of wickedness that it no doubt is difficult for many of us to even be able to recognize wicked ways in ourselves. Ah, but dear friend, if we will bend our knees, bow our hearts and minds before God and ask the Holy Spirit of God to show us those things in our lives which are displeasing to him, we will find, alas, there are more wicked ways in us than we may have imagined, and we need to confess them. The Westminster Confession says that we need to confess particular sins particularly, and that we need to repent of particular sins particularly. Do you do that? Have you done that? What particular sin have you confessed and have you turned from this month? I'll leave that for your contemplation. Next Lord's Day, we will receive the Holy Communion of God, the table of our Lord Jesus. I hope that you will have prepared your heart to receive it aright. And that this nation may indeed once again have the shield restored to it, which has protected and prospered and preserved us as a nation for these years. As his people humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. For him to hear our prayers, to forgive our sins, to cleanse and heal our nation, and to restore its shield would be a glorious outcome to these tragic events of recent days. May it be so. And may it begin with you 
and me. Let us pray. O oh God, deliver us from merely pointing fingers at the wicked over there and not realize the sin and wickedness that lies within our own hearts. O oh God, cleanse us from every evil way, from every stain of sin, that we indeed might be pleasing in thy sight thy children called by thy name being prepared to be with thee forever in paradise pleasing O God in thy sight that we may hear thy well done thou good and faithful servant in Jesus name Amen hello I'm Rob Pacienza, senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. The Bible promises us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, but that promise is made to Christians, to those who have trusted in Christ and who have received him as Lord and Savior. It's not a promise to everyone. Have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ? Do you know for certain that you will spend eternity with him? If not, I invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me of my sins. Please grant me your righteousness and make me your own. Help me serve you and follow you. In your name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, you have begun a whole new adventure with Christ. And to help you grow in your new faith, we'd like to send you the book, Beginning Again, because that is precisely what you're doing. To receive your copy, simply write to our address or call our toll-free number. The name of the book is Beginning Again, and may God richly bless you. What will you find out when you follow the money? Almost everything you see is connected. It is one big web of lies. Where's the money trail? And it tracks back to billions of dollars coming from George Soros into culture. Get the facts in this meticulously compiled Follow the Money Influence Chart and Companion Guide, which shows in graphic detail how George Soros and company undermine your freedom and seek to radically transform America. We know that there are billionaires, George Soros being one of them, funding these groups that are creating chaos. Contact us today to receive your copy of the Follow the Money Chart and Guide. We have done the homework to separate the facts from the myths regarding George Soros and company, and we'll send you these vital resources as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.